You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Making Ends Meet by Aaron Vleck Performed by Otis Jiry I just got done sweeping the front porch down for the third time that day. If there's anything that puts daggers in my eyes, it's too much dust on the front porch. But what am I to do? As far as the eye can see, in any direction, that's all there is, pretty much. Dust and the parched white earth that flows like the sea itself all the way to the Sierra Madres, a week's ride to the north. To the south, east, and west, it's the same, or worse. I make do, though, not complaining. Well, not exactly. I'm all alone out here and have been for a mighty long while now. I went back inside then and took stock of things. All I got here is this one big room and a loft up top where I make my bed. There's a wood stove for heat in one corner and one for cooking, such as I do, in the other. Not much more to speak of, really. Just an old sideboard, a few books, and that wobbly table and some chairs. Changed my apron and retied my hair, shook the dust out of it, and set the pot on the fire for coffee. Then I sat down and put my feet up. That was always nice. Nobody to raise an eye or squawk when I'm not doing what they think I should be doing, whatever the hell that might be. No, it's good living out here, all alone, all by myself. Just me and the dust. The only person who ever comes as far out from town, a good day's hard ride or more, is the sheriff, Roy Verick, good man who looks in on me from time to time, even gives me odd work a couple, three times a month to help me make ends meet. Good old Roy. Then I got the prickle up the back side of the nape of my neck. Rider's coming. Went back out front and stood on the porch. I could barely see that rising swirl of white dust still a good hour away. Good thing I put that coffee on. I figured it was Roy. So there'd be work, I could tell. Too much dust for just one horse. Had to be two, Roy's and the other one. I smiled. Good to know I'd be able to make ends meet this month, so I sat back down in the rocker on my front porch, smoothed down my old faded dress and the apron I'd just put on, and settled in to wait, wondering what Roy would have for me this time. When the horses finally pulled up to the house, I could see they'd been ridden pretty hard. Roy looked beat tired, and the other one weren't much more than a boy, but already hard, cold, and twisted mean inside, without remorse on what he'd done. It was always a shame to see that, you know, and one so young, but it just can't be helped sometimes. Aileen. Roy said, tipping his hat and grinning as he jumped down off that big palomino of his. He tied the horses and then dragged the other, cuffed feet and hands and mouth gagged, onto the ground and then dragged him to his feet. Roy, I said, waiting to hear more. Got coffee. Oh, he's just made it, as it happens, just for you. He snorted and nodded his gratitude as he took off his hat and slapped the dust off himself and the kid. I'll take the horses out back and get them watered and cooled down. You go on inside and help yourself. There's bread and cake on the sideboard and some bacon that might still be good. Much obliged, ma'am, he said, and I could hear in his voice he was tired and something more, angry maybe, more than usual. I chuckled, thinking on that mouth gag. Kid must have been yapping at the mouth. Roy didn't like that kind of thing. He always was a quiet man, a thinking man to be sure, but kept most of it close to his chest like a hand of cards. I got the horses watered and put them in the barn with a bag of oats, a gift from Roy last time, or the time before when he came out my way. 
I could see they was pleased. Such fine, beautiful beasts as they were, too. Roy's Palomino and the other, a fine bay filly with a full white blaze. I stood there a bit, rubbing my hand along their backs, then nickering all the while and nuzzling my neck. I've always had a way with animals. They, they like me, and I like them. It was the other ones, like that boy in there that I had other feelings on. I see you found everything, I said, getting back inside, smiling with satisfaction at the easy comfort Roy showed in my house, helping himself to what was there and knowing without asking where everything was hid. Yes, ma'am, and you uh, be well, I suppose? Oh, yeah, you know me, Roy, always the same. What's to change out here? You need anything, you let me know, here. Yeah? Everything's fine. But what you got here, I asked, gesturing with a shake of my head at the boy who sat sullenly, still cuffed, hand and foot, at the table. The gag had been removed, and the boy glowered at me while he sipped his coffee and stuffed cake in his mouth like he hadn't eaten in a week. What we doing out here, old Roy? Where are you taking me? The kid bellowed, rising up half out of his seat like there was some place to go. Well, Johnny, you see, it's like this. Roy began, tossing me a glance and cracking his knuckles and flexing them before knocking the kid back into his chair. I only got two cells in my jail, and they're full up, so I got the stash of some place. My mother, too. Hell, we got proper trials all set up for those boys. Their path is clear. We got witnesses to their misdeeds. We got confessions all cut and dried sewed up neat as a pin. But you, Johnny, well, we got nothing concrete or to go on. Nothing that makes you good for all them other murders. Just that we know you did it. You know how you can just tell. How you can read it on a man like it was tattooed across his forehead. So uh, we don't know what to do with you. I figured it was easier to stash out here to Raylene's place, a million miles from nowhere, just to put you on ice, so to speak, until we can figure out things, or you decide to grow a pair and own up to your misdeeds and take your justice like a man. Roy said, swirling his coffee and watching the ground settle. Well, that's just plain crazy, Sheriff, the kid bellowed. You mean to just leave me out here with this old widow woman? Roy yowled like a stuck pig, then calmed himself and looked at the kid, shaking his head the while. Raylene ain't no widow woman, son, but I'd best be getting back. I started before sunup, and I'll ride through most of the night. Well, thank you, ma'am. I'll be back in a few days to check on things. He added, slapping his hat back on his head and gathering up the package of food I'd set aside for him for the trial. Then he was out the door and closed it firm behind him. The sound of the iron bar dropping down over that door made the kid almost jump out of his hide. What the hell? You mean he's locked in here? Specs so, I said, refilling my coffee cup. You want any? No. I warn you, ma'am, I'm going to bust out of here. You got horses out back? Nope, no horses here. And Roy took the one you rode in back to town with him. No way out of here, and it's a day's ride to town, as you saw, and twice that or more the other way, as far to anything worth getting to. You may as well get used to it, Johnny, is it? You're stuck here. I said that, and the kid stomped his cuffed feet in rage. But no reason we why we can't pass the time. Why don't you tell me about yourself? I said, grinning and trying to be friendly. We got three days till Roy comes back, and nothing to do but get to know each other a bit. Or you can sit there and sulk in silence, thinking back on your deeds that got you here. The call, Johnny. You let me know what you decide. 
I said, tinkering around in my kitchen, such as it was, uh, cleaning up. But you're locked in here, same as me, he yelled out. Why'd you let him do that? Ain't you afraid? Nah, I ain't afraid, I said, and it was the truth. Well, you got water and hit water for three days for the two of us and all our needs, the kid added, blanching with the realization. Don't you worry, I got water in here from my well out back. Damn good well, too. And a miracle, if you ask me. Sweetest water you ever tasted. Oh, hell, he groaned. Okay, so what's your story, then? You first, being the guest and all, I said. After all, this was my job, looking after these folks were brought to me, and I take my job seriously doing the best I can. I saw the kid trying the handcuffs under the table, seeing if, with a little wriggling and a bit of pain, he could pull himself free. I shook my head. It was always this way. No use, Johnny. Best get talking. Why don't you start telling me why you're here? What do they say you did? Said I killed me nigh on to fifteen people. Some of them nothing but kids, he snorted. It was hard to tell if it was with revulsion or something else. Something more akin to pride, maybe. All at once, or, you know, like one at a time. One at a time, of course. He bellowed and looked at me like I was a damn fool. Well, did you? I pressed, but he just glared at me. No. He muttered under his breath after a long pause. He still refused to look at me, but his breathing picked up a bit, and he opened his mouth and licked his lips, and I smiled. Tell me, Johnny, I said, my voice dropping almost to a whisper. You get the blood urge, don't you? Comes on you all at once, no warning or nothing, am I right? I ask, my voice now low and kind of conspiratorial in its tone. He shot me a glance like he was a scared rabbit in a sprung trap. I, 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 no, he hissed, but it had a hollow ring to it, like he didn't quite mean it. Yes, I said, grinning. I can see it now on you, boy. You're not like other folks, and they'll never understand that. Am I right? Well, maybe you got that right. Not even my mom and pa wanted anything to do with me after a while. I'd seen pa kill chickens a hundred times, but when I did it, well, they threw me out. I was just trying to help, damn them said I enjoyed it too much. Can you imagine such a thing? He replied, pounding the table with his cuffed fists. I understand, Johnny. Damn fools. They should have let you be, set you up butchering cows and such, so you could put your skills to doing a man's work, useful work, and not have to move beyond, you know? Johnny just smiled at me like he was a little kid and I was his mama, all trusting-like. I understood him all right. First time in his life somebody understood him and saw him for what he was. He killed because he had a need. A need he just couldn't put aside. So tell me about them girls then, and the other ones too. How many were there? I asked like I was inquiring how many taters was left in the sack. Well, if you're sure, ma'am... Johnny said, his voice all meek now for the first time. I'm sure, son, go ahead. It'll do you good to get it off your chest to someone who understands, who knows what you're going through. I purred, nodding my head and encouraging him. Well, okay. See, okay, so there was nineteen all told from the beginning. He said, licking his lips again and taking a big gulp of air. The first time I was in Dandy's place all night, staggering home, pissed drunk when I saw this open window, curtains flapping in the breeze, and this little angel sleeping in her bed. 
Before I knew what had come over me, I was back home in my bunk, blood in my hands, clothes soaked in it, and my head pounding about ready to bust wide open. Hmm, I said softly. Go on. Well, it only took a day before I figured out what happened, hearing the outrage and chatter in town over it. But nobody suspected me, so I breathed a sigh of relief. I'd got away with it. I'd got clean away with it. And nobody was the wiser. So I hightailed it out of there, Johnny said, grinning like a kid on Christmas Eve. I see. Yeah, well, that sounds about right. I've heard this kind of thing before. Folks like you, it seems pretty natural in a way when you look at it like that. You do it and it's natural, just like anybody would. Yes, ma'am. So after that, it just got easier and easier. I went on for a good two, three years and more like that, going from town to town and moving on, keeping myself low and quiet, like coming into town after dark so nobody would know me enough to put things together. I'd just do my business and then ride out. And what happened, Johnny? And I come to this accursed town where your pal old Sheriff Roy Varick had been keeping tabs on the killings and even had himself a big old map with pins stuck in all the spots where there'd been killings, all the places I'd passed through. I figure maybe he must have been waiting for me. Sure he was, waiting for whoever I happened to be. I hadn't been to that town yet, but when I got there, they had some posse set up in all the houses where there was kids, widows, or some broken-down old geezer on his own. Had themselves some guardian angel with a Winchester on his knee aimed at the window, sitting vigil till sunup. That night, I came into town after dark, as was my custom. I figured I'd do my business and be gone before anybody laid eyes on me. But no, that just was not to be. As soon as I crawled in that window, I was grabbed by the neck and slammed to the floor like a calf on brandy with the butt of a rifle to the head and then dragged half senseless to the sheriff. But it was strange. He didn't arrest me, didn't charge me with nothing, didn't even ask me about any crimes. Just gagged me and cuffed me to this outhouse where I lay like a dog in the mud the rest of the night. Had me, sure, I suppose he did. But he never did arrest me or try to prove nothing. And the next morning we lit out for here and I got no damn idea why. Well, you got to pay for your crimes, Johnny, one way or the other. The fact you set up a plan for the killing, it was real clever to set out a way to not get caught. That shows you got no shame in your deeds. You know that, right? I said. No, no, I don't. Hell no, I don't. It's just my way. You's right about that. The way I see it, though, old Sheriff Roy wasn't so smart after all. What the hell made him bring me out here, guarded by some old woman? I'm not staying put here, ma'am. You gotta see that, and beg your pardon for saying. You got that fine Winchester sitting right there. But I'm a third of your age, and even with these cuffs on, I can put you down before you can even make a go for it. I don't want to hurt you. You'd be awful nice to me, all things considered, but I mean to have my freedom at all costs. He sat there for a moment, like he thought he was at some kind of stalemate. Johnny, didn't you tell me Roy never arrested you? Never took nothing down on you, not even your name, nothing. That's right, damn sloppy fool by my reckoning. No, I said with a whisper, not without a drop of pity. Roy's no fool. And he's never known a sloppy man in his life. Now, here's the thing you gotta understand. Roy and me, we got this arrangement, see? I ain't got much out here, and frankly, I don't need much to keep me going. Just a little bit to make ends meet each month, besides the few taters I grow out back and my chickens. So Roy, he brings me work now and then. 
work he can't rightly handle on his own in town through the usual means. And it helps me to make ends meet, as I say. I explained, smiling and feeling that delicious tingle in my body clear down to my toes whenever I start to going my way. It was beginning, sure enough, and soon Johnny would see exactly what I meant. My body started stretching out long, getting longer and longer, faster and faster. Then my head burst into that horned and fanged crown that was my glory, and my feet did the same, and popped the head of the like out of the two of them. And there I was, all twenty feet of my magnificent, two-headed, scaled, and dripping gore mass splendor of hunger. Johnny started screaming, but hell, I figured. He'd gone mad long before I even turned to look at him, vomiting on himself and filling the air with his stink. Then I spun around, two heads coming together onto Johnny's body, in the middle, making ends meet and taking him whole in one gulp and tearing him clean in two and gobbling him down, each mouth getting its fair share. The blood flowed everywhere thick and sweet, and it was so very, very good. I couldn't rightly decide, and never could really, which I found more to my liking in these boys. All that blood with a look of fear and something else when they looked into my eyes, you know, towards the end, and only saw their own face looking back at them in my black eyes, reminding them of what they'd done to all those other folks who'd never done them a lick of harm. I finished that boy off, and then I licked myself clean, curled up in a coil on the kitchen floor, and took a long nap, which was my way. Plenty of time to sleep through tomorrow, even, and plenty of time to clean things up before Sheriff Roy came back to look in on me and see that I was all right. But then he knew I would be. He's such a nice man, that Roy Varick. I thought to myself, smiling and drifting off into those dreams I get, dreams of other things and other places, already a hunger building up in me for what Sheriff Roy Varick would bring out from town the next time he came to call. 